Welcome inside episode 524 of the Locked On Senators podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains and the Ottawa Senators start a light week with only two games, both on the road in Nashville tomorrow and Detroit on Friday, but they've got a new face at practice. But Ross, it's not number 85, Jake Sanderson, although he did sign his deal with the Ottawa Senators yesterday. So we're going to get into that with friend of the show, Alex Heinert, joining on this episode. Stay tuned for all that and more. Today's episode is brought to you by BetOnline.net. BetOnline.net has you covered with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. It's BetOnline.net, where the game starts. And now the show starts. This is the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day. Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Senators your first listen on this Monday, March 28th. And later today, Jake Sanderson will arrive in Ottawa. What a moment for Sens fans. We've been waiting for this for a while. We knew it was going to happen at the end of this season, but North Dakota's season cut very short, much shorter than we anticipated, Ross. But where one door closes, another one opens, and now number 85 is coming to the Ottawa Senators. Only the sixth player to wear number 85 in league history, second in Ottawa Senators history, and it was kind of an active number, you could argue, because the Sens still do hold Abramov's rights as an RFA. He was qualified, but back playing in the KHL. So I wonder what he thought of that. What did you think? 85, it's a pretty unique number. Well, it kind of threw me for a loop because we were looking at a couple different other options. 88 was an option. Six, maybe. How about 24? There were some options. 26, but that one is already taken in this franchise. And I think, uh, well... It's uh, that'd be interesting to see if uh, Sanderson tried to get that number off France or maybe a Rolex watch or something exchanged. But those are two guys on their entry level deal, so that'd be one hell of an exchange. But I, I was not anticipating number eighty five whatsoever. Like that one wasn't even on my radar when it first was announced. I I didn't love it. I kind of was like, uh, that seems like a crappy training camp number, but. It's Jake Sanderson. If he's ready to rock number 85 and he wants to carve his own path and be a little unique, we, we saw it with Carlson with number 65. So just 20, 20 numbers uh, higher, maybe he can do the same. And I did some mental gymnastics here and I figured out it's because he initially wanted number eight. So he had to get the eight in there somehow, yeah. some way. And then he was the fifth overall pick in the draft. So you put the two together and bang. You got number 85. We won't see number 85 on the ice anytime soon. Still recovering from a deep cut on his hand that he suffered in the final game of his collegiate career. We're going to talk to Alex Heiner about that later on in the show. Great reminiscing of his time with North Dakota. We we get into all that. You know Alex Heiner, the play-by-play voice on Midco Sports with North Dakota. He is really in a class of his own when it comes to that and he just brings great energy to the show hey oh yeah he's such a good vibes guy and uh if if there's anything better than a jake sanderson goal called by alex heiner i haven't heard it because that is uh that is an amazing combo name me a better duo i'll wait yes and mix in jake brant there too who does the color for them another friend of the show so we'll get to more jake sanderson conversation with alex heiner we're gonna throw a little clip in from our interview we did yesterday, bonus interview yep. with Brad Schlossman, who covers North Dakota for the Grand Forks Herald. Locked on Senators, your team every day. We're not kidding when we say that, but that one will live on our YouTube page. So go subscribe there. Locked on Senators, the road to 2000 continues. And if the Sens keep playing like they did Saturday, I don't know if the vibes have been that good after a loss in a long time. The Sens blew a three goal lead. <laughs> But everyone after the game was given stick taps and, and high fives, maybe a few hugs to Pierre Dorian if he asked politely. But what was your what was your impression now, 48 hours? Of course, we did the postcast right after the game again on our YouTube channel. But what, what was your thoughts there? That was a pretty wild and entertaining overtime period. Ross, if we were doing that postcast and your postcast title was Sens win 4-3 in shootout over the Florida Panthers – 
I think it would have been the same postcast. Like the win or loss didn't really matter. And I think a big part of this is the atmosphere at the CTC was absolutely electric. Over 17,000 fans. That's got that's the most fans that has been there in years. Even the home opener was only around 15,000. So you could feel that infectious energy coming off the screen. Like in your living room, you could feel the CTC getting loud with the Zoob chants, with uh, getting so loud when the Sens scored. And yes, they did blow a 3 nothing lead, which is... <laughs> Not great at all. But when you have a 3 nothing lead up against a team like the Florida Panthers, you kind of expect them to push back, and they pushed back. And it ended up being a great game and a great entertaining game. So I think that's the main thing. Right now, Sens fans, wins, losses, sure, you, you love the Ws better, but it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. So basically, we want to be entertained, and we want to see reasons to have positivity with the team mo- moving forward. And we saw a lot of those reasons in that game. Certainly did, and I thought it was unique where DJ Smith decided he was going to go three forwards in overtime, which was uh, a great play. Even four forwards for the power play, Ross. Yeah, 100%. Typically, uh, a lot of coaches would put the one defenseman back there just in case, but he probably thought, hey, if I'm going to use a defenseman, it's Branstrom, and he's basically a quasi-forward anyways, so we may as well just mix it in, and they were this close to scoring the game winner, and it would have been a deja vu with Drake Batherson yes. assisting primarily on a Josh Norris goal. He just couldn't get it up over the pad of Sergei Bobrovsky, but an entertaining game nonetheless. Claude Giroux watch continues. That guy is a complete stud. And the Ottawa Senators have a few studs coming up, and one of them we might get a glimpse of, as I mentioned off the top, new face at practice. It's Mad Sogard, the Great Dane. And not only will we touch on what this means for Mad Sogard, but initially, I'm sure you're relieved that it means Philip Gustafson is likely going to get some games in with Belleville. Ross, that was my initial reaction. By initial, I mean that lasted about two or three seconds because it's important to take note, Belleville doesn't play till Friday. So likely Gustafson, you know, who who knows how long Sogard's going to stick up here. Pierre Dorian did say he wanted to get him in for at least one game. There's two games this week, like you mentioned. So yeah, maybe it gives Gus an extra start here, but it's it's not as drastic as I had hoped. Like if they had a Wednesday and a Friday game, then maybe get Gus for two starts and that's great. But I I think shifting to Matt Sogard, this is a great thing for him. He's proven that he can handle a lot of responsibility down in Belleville as uh, Mando has been down and Gustafson had to be called up. So he's really the only guy apart from a couple PTOs joining him. So I think it's a good reward for Matt Sogard. He gets a little extra boost in the paycheck and... He gets to be around an NHL team, which is kind of like dangling the carrot, you know, like, all right, you've seen AHL life. This is what the NHL life is like. Keep working and we can get you here because the goalie situation in Ottawa for the future is wide open, pretty much. Apart from Anton Forsberg being a part of the mix somehow, some way, there is a lot of opportunity for these young goalies to say, hey, I could see myself being the 1A goalie for the Sens in the future here. I'm approve it now. There's a lot of games coming up. Once Friday hits, though, so this probably a great opportunity to get a few practices in beforehand if you're Mad Sogard. And I hope that's what the thought process was behind bringing him up on a Monday where they only play Tuesday and Friday. So after that, they play Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So the games are going to come fast and furious. And if I'm DJ Smith, if I'm Pierre Dorian, if I'm Zach Burke, I probably keep Mad Sogard here for at least two weeks. Why not? Uh, Forsberg's realistically going to play in eighty percent of the games, anyways. Honestly, yeah. And we saw Mads can pl- play in a new situation pretty well. Seven and zero in his start of his AHL career when he finished the year off there last season. So I'm hopeful that he gets three starts. That that's a good number for me. And just eyeing the opponents here coming up. You'd like to see him in one of those games against Detroit. They play Friday and Sunday against Detroit. I'd probably sp- start him on the Sunday afternoon game yeah. in Ottawa, but maybe the afternoon game. I oh, know it's not Matt Murray. He can handle an afternoon game. And then, hey, maybe the next weekend you give him a bit of a tougher test, especially if he plays well. They've got a back to back. I don't know if you're starting him at MSG. That might be a bit of a play looking down the ice at Igor Shesterkin at the other <laughs> end saying, I got to battle him. But then the next night, they're back home again against the Winnipeg Jets, a team where 
the team has confidence. They just beat them on the road. So I would like to see that. The two Sundays in a row, I'd like to see him get in those two games. And then if he plays well, maybe before you send him back, that next game after the Jets, it's a Tuesday game at Detroit. That way he gets two home games, one road game, both two against Detroit. Where, where they gave up 11 goals last night. So yeah. hopefully that comes out next weekend. We get a little point night for the Ottawa Senators. But I, I'm hoping three games. Do you have a preference of how many he plays before the swap? And then again, that just leaves time for Gustafson to get some reps down in Belleville as well. Ross, sign me up for that plan. I, I, I will co-sign on that uh, contract agreement any day. I think that's a perfect amount for Mad Sogard. And hopefully it gives Philip Gustafson some some continuity. You know, hopefully he's just like, okay, I'm here in Belleville. I'm not, I don't have to worry about being bounced up and down, traveling, changing uh, teams, everything like that. I can just focus on starting these games because it really seems like Michael McNiven is just a placeholder backup, which is kind of what we expected. But I really thought he was going to get into a game uh, this weekend with Belleville, but they, did, they didn't do that. They went with Mad Sogard back to back. So I, I think it's pretty clear that he's just an extra guy and they're going to be moving around Sogard and Gustafson to try to get them in good situations to start games, whether it's in the NHL or AHL. So the Ottawa Senators will be in Nashville tomorrow. So we'll reminisce about some old friends. We're not sure if Mark Borvietz, he's going to be in the lineup. He's out with injury right now. Matthew Shane is down there. Ben Harper's down there as well. So we'll touch on that in a preview in tomorrow's show. But let's get to Alex Heinert, an absolute beauty, a true talent. And it's not going to be long before you hear him calling NHL games. He's too good to stay at the college level. But I bet you before his games, he's firing up with a built bar. That's how he gets that energy. This time of the year, we're already in late March. You're your New Year's resolution, let's be honest, it's probably in the rearview mirror. But if you actually enjoy your resolution, it's likely to last a lot longer. So grab a Bilt Bar and get all the nutrition you need, but in the feeling like you're eating a candy bar. And have you tried the Bilt Bar Puffs? You really should. If not, you're missing out on one of Bilt Bar's best tasting bars. They're literally protein-infused marshmallows. Yeah. Listen to that again. Protein-infused marshmallow. Are you kidding me? They're fluffy. They're marshmallowy. Not just a protein bar. They're a treat, and they're covered in 100% chocolate, just like all Bilt Bars are. Low calorie, high protein. Replace your candy bars with these. They are way, way better. Go to Bilt.com and scroll down to the macros chart, and you can see just where all the nutrients are coming from. At Bilt Bar, they're all about the taste. They make it delicious first, and then they figure out how to make it healthy. I don't know how they do it, but they pull it off every single time. So go to built.com, use promo code LOCK15 and get 15% off your next order. It's LOCK15 for 15% off your next order at built.com. All right, here he is, play-by-play voice for the North Dakota Fighting Hawks. It's Alex Heiner. All right, we now welcome back a friend of the show, the best voice in college hockey. It's Alex Heiner. You can find him with Midco Sports, the play-by-play voice for North Dakota hockey as well. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing today, man? Yo, I'm great, fellas. Thanks so much for having me. I know, been a while. Good, good to be back. Yeah, yeah, from the pod. And then we were talking so much last year because there were four note accents. Yep. And now... There's only one. We'll touch on Clevin later on, but the news of the day, the news of the week is Jake Sanderson has signed his entry-level contract. I want to go back to how he opened his account, as you would say, with North Dakota. (laughs) When he blasted that shot from the top of the left circle, did you know what you were going to get for the upcoming 41 games? I mean, we had a pretty good idea coming in. I mean, expectations obviously were very high based on his pedigree, the the job that he had done with the national team leading into his college days. And then the fact that he's picked fifth overall, like expectations were really high for this player. But yeah, we got a little taste of it in the pod. You know, in December of 2020, he only played the first three games before leaving for world junior duty, but you could sell right away. I mean, he just didn't look out of place in the best league in the country from day one. And that growth over the course of his freshman season uh, really peaked in the national tournament. You could see the kind of player he was going to be, assuming he was going to come back. And we were all excited that he did, of course, for his sophomore season. And then really outside of injury and having to go play for his country a couple different times, 
he was phenomenal. I mean, he was the best player in college hockey this season. And it was a treat to get to watch him. I only wish we could have watched him a little more. I mean, he missed 14 games this year. And you think about what they could have done, North Dakota as a team, if he would have been in the lineup night in, oh, night out. Yeah. And they still had a great season. I mean, they won the regular season championship in their conference. But uh, obviously a special kid. Sad to see him go. Excited for you both that you get a chance to watch him now when he gets healthy again, night in, night out in a Sens uniform. A long time coming for you guys. I know you're excited about this. Definitely a long time coming. And yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I want to kind of get the vibe um from someone that covers the team and the local aspect, like it's got to be a bit of a bittersweet moment, right? Like everyone kind of expected he's going to go pro. It was not a surprise to anyone, but now, like you said, you didn't get to see full Jake Sanderson this season with all the trips and injuries and everything going on. What's the vibe like at North Dakota now knowing that one of the most exciting prospects to ever play there is now leaving? Yeah, bittersweet, Brandon, is a good word for it. Anytime, you know, Bradbury talks about this. You're excited to send guys off to the pros when they're ready. And obviously, Jake is ready. I mean, this is a case of, you you see some people on Twitter today, like, oh, gosh, I wish he could have stayed another year. Oh, it would have been great if he could have came back. Oh, he's going to miss this place. Like, those sorts of comments. And some of those things are true. And you do wish you get more time with these guys who are so elite. But at the same time, I mean, if you're ready, there's no sense in spending another season playing against competition that's just below you. You know, go test yourself. Like, that's what makes these people who they are as athletes and competitors. You want to go test yourself against the best. And clearly, he's ready for that next level. So, uh, we're. Ex- I mean, there's, a, there's excitement, obviously. You're excited to see him go. You're excited to cheer him on at the next level and see what he can do uh, at Ottawa in the NHL. Hopefully sooner than later, whenever he recovers from this hand injury. But yes, of course, deep down, you're like, oh, it would have been nice if he would have had one more year to get to enjoy some of the highlight real stuff. And just the the everyday stuff that he was so good at. Those are things that we will certainly miss around Grand Forks. Pilsy asked this to Brad, and I want to bring up something else that we asked Brad, but I'll let Pilsy ask that one. So we'll flip it so the listeners get a little fresh perspective. But the one I'm going to ask you here is when it comes to how he ended his tenure at North Dakota diving across to try to save a goal in the final minute. Does that just depict what he brought day in and day out, both on the ice and around campus? Yeah, I think that's a really good example. I think that he was the perfect blend of a guy who was better than everybody else, but didn't play like it and didn't act like it. You know, he he came in and had such a humility to him from day one. Like our first we always do interviews with all of the freshmen when they get to campus and you kind of, you know, sort of generic kind of get to know you things, tell us about your background, et cetera. And like, he was just the most level-headed guy and you'd have no idea that his dad was a longtime NHL player, that he was a top five draft pick in the NHL and, you know, charismatic said, thanks to all the crew, shook everybody's hands. I mean, like that was from day one as an 18 year old. And that's how he was throughout his college career. Like for those two years, he was just the type of guy you really would want to play with on a team or the guy you'd want to cheer for as a fan and, and a guy you'd want to, you know, interview and do stories about and cover, you know, as someone in the media, like just, just the, the, the epitome of what you'd want in, in a student athlete at this level and as a hockey player in general. So, yeah, I mean, the fact that he would put his body on the line for his team in a situation like that, when you're trying to move on to the next round of the postseason, I mean, that, that certainly sums it up. And really that weekend too, because he scores a highlight real goal, to, to put them up one nothing in game yep. one the day before you got to see both sides of him the flash and the substance on the same weekends it was a pretty good way for him to close out his career obviously you'd love it if he was able to keep going and didn't get hurt <laughs> but if you were going to pick a sequence of events he got one more highlight real moment in the ralph and he does this to force you know to win the game in regulation instead of the opposition forcing overtime that that was jake sanderson in a nutshell so that's one of the many highlight reel plays and uh, not just offense, but like you said, putting his body on the line and who better to ask this question than the guy that's covered him all year. So I, I want to get your opinion, Alex, what was your signature Jake Sanderson moment? Like for you, like when you're thinking back to all the great calls you had for him, which one stands out in your mind? is like that one really defined Jake Sanderson. And I'll give you a, a quick note because I know you weren't calling this game. I just went back and watched the highlights. Brad Schlossman said the weekend in Miami where he had the six points. He was weaving all over the offensive zone. But I like Pilsy tightening it up there at the Ralph. What got the fans <laughs> fired up at the Ralph? 
Oh man. I mean, yeah, that Miami weekend, so like he just was toying with people. It was yeah. ridiculous. Just <laughs> the way that he was able to skate around the defense over and over again with the puck glued to his stick. Uh, I mean, there were a lot of moments. I mean, when we've seen a lot of the highlights now today after the release, after he signs, like the, the tributes have started to come out and you get a chance <laughs> to relive some of that. We did a, um, we did sort of a top 10 plays of the regular season for North Dakota. And again, Jake missed, Jake missed a quarter of the season, a third of the season, just about. Jason, you missed a lot of games this year between the Olympics, the World Juniors, being hurt a couple of different times. And he was on the list, I think, four times of the 10. I mean, with just <laughs> special plays. He made a couple of plays this year that just, you know, there was a game against St. Cloud State. The one when he picks up the puck on the far circle, hesitates, you know, toe drags around the guy and scores. And his, his goal against Colorado College in the NCHC quarterfinals was very similar. Just a great patient move where he outweights the defender, waits for him to go down, and then just labels a shot right where the goaltender is not going to get it. He had that ability, but he also had the ability to blow by guys. You think about the end-to-end -end goal that he scored early in the season. I think it was an exhibition against Bemidji State, so it didn't even count. But he basically went from the goal line and just was just faster than everybody and then was able to beat the goaltender. And that was kind of like the first taste. Like, oh, this this is really going to be special this year. It's so tough to pick just one because he had – he had a ton of great moments. The five overtime game last year, too, against Minnesota Duluth, when it's the fifth overtime. They've been playing hockey for six and a half hours of regular time, <laughs> and he still looks fresh, like they just had dropped the puck. I mean, th those are some of the things that I remember most, like just his incredible skating and his stamina and the way that he just – he never seemed to fade as the game went on. And I don't know. He, he could just do the highlight reel thing and make it look really easy, and then he could make – you know, the, the difficult defensive play just better than anybody else. It's it's really tough. I'm sorry, Brandon. It's really tough. Hey, it's a big no. just one. He was a special guy, and he crammed a lot of that, a lot of those memories into a two-year time. And those two qualities remind Sens fans, I'm sure, listening to this, a lot of their number one defenseman right now, Thomas Shabbat, yes. who's led yep. the NHL in ice time over the last few years. And one thing we're noting, we are telling you before we went on, just the the tease that he's here, but not quite. And we had that with the two week quarantine with, with Shane Pinto and JBD when they signed last year, but Thomas Shabbat's also out broken hand, not sliced, but broken. So what better welcome to the NHL moment than sitting in the stands every day, watching practice with Thomas Shabbat, being able to go over the X's and O's and Hey, here's how we do this system here. And there's how we can help there. So I think that's going to help a lot. Now, what kind of uh, impact do you think he left off the ice as well? Do you think this is the kind of guy where Brad Berry next season in uh, training camp is going to be like, all right, remember what Jake did here. Remember how he calmed it down. It, it poise is basically what I'm getting at. That's kind of something that we haven't touched on there. We talked about the stamina and the flash, but is that something that you think could transfer to the NHL sooner rather than later, his ability to maybe hold on and be patient and make the right play versus the first play? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, you got to see that in the Olympics a little bit. And obviously, he only played one game. One know, hell of a game, though. He well, had, you know, had an assist, and he was the best guy on the ice yeah. when he was out there. And that's and that was coming off of a week's quarantine in Los Angeles and basically a morning skate with the team that he was playing with. So I think that he's the type of kid that is very adaptable and has a very cool head and a mind for the game. And those things – will translate and obviously the game is going to be fast for him right away but I don't think it'll be fast for him for very long so I, I know I know that you know you talk about Bradbury using Jake as an example for future players next season I guarantee that, that that his name is going to come up and they'll show video to some of the young guys and they won't have a lot of new defensemen because basically everybody's back but when that time comes and they bring in freshman defensemen I'm sure that they'll be calling up Jake Sanderson clips to be like hey this is how he did it. You, you, you are now wearing this uniform. We would like you to play like this. I'm sure that those will be things that will get brought up because he is, he was the consummate North Dakota player. And, you know, it, it's one of those things you knew you weren't going to have him very long, but he made the most of his time here and left a pretty big impact. And Bradbury's talked about that now since the signing has happened, just talking about how he left He They always talk about enhancing the culture, you know, adding to the tradition. Jake Sanderson did that. Yeah, and I think Sens fans uh, can appreciate that. Even from afar, you can tell the impact that this guy had. And I want to ask you, uh, so he only gets two seasons, like you talk about. His first season, he's kind of hemming and hawing. Should I go back to school? Should I go pro now? In your opinion, what really did he change in that second season where now himself, 
Coach Bradbury, fans, like everybody is fully confident now that he is ready to go pro. What was the biggest difference from year one to year two? Well, I think we saw at the end of year one, his confidence increase, you know, and I think not, not that he wasn't confident in his abilities coming into college hockey. I mean, he had played against older players, you know, with, with that U18 team, with the national team development program, you're playing a full USHL schedule. You're playing guys that are, you know, it, that have been through juniors a couple of years. Plus you're also playing some of the best college teams in the country. So he's played against good opposition, but there also is a sense, Hey, you're, you're a freshman and you're coming to North Dakota and this is, this is a big program, and, and last year's team was so veteran-heavy, and you mentioned some of those names. I mean, Shane Pinso and Jacob Bernard Docker and Jasper Weatherby and guys who are everyday NHL guys now. That's who he's joining up with a season ago. And he started to take more ownership of the team towards the end of last year. And this year, you could tell he's wearing a letter this season. You could tell he felt like, all right, I'm, I'm driving this bus. You know, I'm one of the leaders on this team. And that's, that, that just enhanced level of ownership of, of the, the fate of a particular game or a season that really increased. I think he knew more and more it's on me to raise my teammates game and raise my game for us to have opportunities to have success. Cause this starts to go to team really compared to last year's team, not nearly as talented, but Jake was able to step his game up and, and you could see his teammates kind of rally around him. And then when he was injured or left, the huge void that he left really caused his teammates to step up. And I think Jake was a great voice off the ice to help encourage those guys to fill what was missing when he was out of the lineup. So I think that's those would be the biggest things I would see that he's taken the biggest jump in. Because, again, the skating, the vision, you know, the skill, et cetera, all those things were there from day one for him. It's just been a matter of now feeling like, all right, I'm responsible for perhaps doing this on a regular basis or else we're not going to win this contest. Yeah, very well said, Alex. We just have a couple more for you, and everyone go make sure you're following him on, on Twitter as well. Alex is a fantastic talent. Oh, before I ask my final question, we have to say thank you. You made my heart smile so <laughs> wide when you had that call. It was in the game you were talking about. Sanderson yep. scores first, then Tyler Clevin. The Nodak sends are loving it, and everyone, everyone piled on. It just kind of shows the community that North Dakota has kind of allowed us in. And we appreciate yes. that. Now I have no idea the answer to this question. Maybe there isn't one. I was trying to find like an all time defensive points leaders or North Dakota, but Jake Sanderson was the best defenseman at North Dakota since blank. Is there a guy who comes up as a guy who really stood up? Cause obviously sense fans think of Christian will land and oh, he played pretty <laughs> well, but is there a guy who in the history of North Dakota, you can maybe look at and say like, Oh man, like, Maybe he could challenge Jake Sanderson, or are we looking at one of the best defensemen in call in program history? Yeah, and I think you could say that. I mean, you go back like James Patrick, for example, in the early '80s, yep. who led the team in scoring, and up, up until Christian Mulanen broke the, you know, set the team scoring record, or whatever. Did he really? Ago. I didn't. Oh, I, I didn't know. That. I, just... I guess I should probably rephrase that. So James Patrick was the last defenseman to lead North Dakota in scoring until Christian Mulanen did it. Like okay. You know, 30 years later. That's so awesome. that was always kind of the comparison. Like this guy led this team, this, this perennial powerhouse in scoring from defense. And nobody had done that since now, if Jake would have been healthy this season, and this is with all due respect to Reese Gaber, who had a great year and, and was a first team, all, you know, all conference type guy and, and put up a lot of points. Jake probably would have led North Dakota in scoring this year and would have <laughs> continued that. I think he finished third in scoring, even though he missed 14 games, he was over a point per game this year. So I think when you look through the list, especially of guys that went on to have NHL success, I mean, there were a lot of good defensemen at North Dakota. James Patrick was probably the most offensive-minded defenseman who also had success in the NHL. And that would probably be the, the comp that, like, yeah, this guy is on that level of someone that was an All-American at the college level, had success in the pros, could score, could create. You know, they're really it, – it's just tough to put right now – other guys that had good careers at North Dakota yeah. in the same category as Jake, just because we know oh, yeah. the future is ahead of Jake. And we've seen some of the guys that have come through the program, guys like Troy Stetcher that were great in college yep. and have been good NHL players, yep. but have still kind of bounced around a little bit, you know, in recent seasons. Um, Pillsy's like favorite, uh, say, Mike, Mike Commodore, different style, but oh, yeah, comic, completely yeah. different stuff. I mean, completely <laughs> different kind of player. I mean, there's, there have been a lot of different iterations of a North Dakota defenseman over the years. And Jake yeah. is pretty unique in that sense. So he would certainly be on the short list of, you know, great North Dakota defensemen. It's just a matter now of, yeah, how, how does his pro career shape out if he ends up being 
you know, top of the mountain on that one all said and done. Looking at James Patrick's career, if Sanderson plays 1,280 NHL games, Ooh. I give that a big thumbs up. He's now the head coach, that. actually, of uh, Winnipeg's WHL team. Funny. Yeah. Enough. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. So, P- Pills, little- you got one. Uh, you got uh, you got a K-Train question to finish it us off, eh? Yeah. Speaking of defensemen in Nodak, the final Nodak Sens player, now oh. Tyler Clevin. And- Verbal meme. It's Will Smith standing in the room all by himself. Yeah. Like, where'd everybody go? <laughs> where all my Nodak Sens at? Um but hey, Ross and I have said a couple times, we, we do believe Clevin will be back at North Dakota. We think that's best for him, uh, probably best for, for everyone. And I mean, when you're going back to a prestigious program like UND, there's nothing wrong with that at all, especially with a great coach in Brad Berry there. Um, Phil, do you think the facilities are better than in Belleville? <laughs> I think uh, I haven't seen uh, the facilities, but uh, from what I've heard, it sounds like they might be. So Tyler Clevin definitely can uh, continue to use everything that UND has to offer. And final question for me, Alex, thanks so much for joining us. We love having you on the show as always is what's uh, what's next for Tyler Clevin. Now that uh, Jake Sanderson will be moving on, he's going to have a lot more opportunity probably to have an elevated role with uh, Nodak. What do you think next season looks like for Clevin? Well, Tyler, yeah, Tyler this season, um, in a lot of ways, it was similar to his freshman year where you saw flashes, you know, on both ends. I mean, all, all the boxes just continue to be checked in terms of being a big physical defenseman that can bring some offense to his game and has the hardest shot in the country. And numbers wise, he probably put up maybe a couple more goals than he did as a freshman, had a few more penalty minutes uh, this year, <laughs> some, some merited, some not, you know, but I think, um, yes, I would agree with you both that, yeah, he's going to be back in the fold next year for North Dakota. I think another year in college is going to be great for him. And as you said, especially this year, you know, he was always on either – he was – I don't want to say he was a second-pair defenseman, but he was, really. It was Jake and Ethan Frisch were sort of the top pair, and then Tyler Clevin and Chris Jandrick, who had a a great season. He was an Alaska transfer that came in and was good right away and was a really good foil for Tyler. Uh, Those two were almost always the second pair. Next year, it's probably going to be – you know, the K-Train and Ethan Frisch as their top Ooh, pair, a couple of nice. local guys from the Fargo-Moorhead area. Awesome. And and you would assume that Tyler, again, takes a step and he's going to be playing in all situations. You know, you would you would hope that he could continue to develop and be on either the first or second power play unit, you know, to be killing penalties, you know, to be playing a lot of minutes next season. And that's going to be good for him, I think, to feel that sense of responsibility. Just like we talked about with Jake, Tyler's going to feel that sense of responsibility now next year. Like, hey, I'm, one, I'm an upperclassman now. I'm one of the veterans on this decor. I need to step up my game. I need to probably clean up some things in terms of taking some penalties that were unnecessary. And by the way, when you look at the numbers and I want like, it was over 90 penalty minutes this year. And that's a lot, obviously (laughs) game misconducts and those things. A lot of those really, he got a reputation for just being bigger and stronger than other guys. And you'd have these big hits and they'd look bad and they would be clean hits. And he'd find himself in the box for five minutes Mm -hmm. or out of the game. And some of that stuff just – there were a couple, of course, that, you know, were just dumb penalties that he needs to clean up. But I really thought he did a good job this year of keeping himself out of those situations and sort of were – he was wrongfully accused, I think, a handful of times. But, <laughs> but I think he, he's going to have an opportunity now to step into a much bigger role next season. Yeah. And, and the question is now, yeah, can he take on that extra burden? And I think he can. I think we've seen that in his career over time. This is going to bear out to be a really good player, I think, for, for Ottawa. But certainly next season, North Dakota is going to re- really rely on him. And I think he's going to be up for the challenge. Do you think his opponents will start figuring out to keep their head up when they come out of the zone? It's his third year, and, and we see it like every second game. He's taken right – that's the K-train. You get off the tracks, and that seems to be a, one of his all-time repertoire moves. Like, is anyone going to figure it out? Check the game notes. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> 90 pims. Come on. Yeah. I know, man. I know. Right. Like that's, he is just, he just continues to be bigger and stronger. And, and honestly, like his skating is good. Like he's, he, he is a, a rugged rock of a man back there and likes throwing his body around and guys just aren't ready to get hit by someone that big. And we've seen that a lot this season and you hope moving forward, you hope he's out of the box a little bit more. Well, we know that North Dakota doesn't rebuild. They reload. Famous words made by uh, Christian Willanden. So we look forward to teeing up the season with you, Alex. And uh, we got to buy you a beer next time. Maybe a B-dubs when we're down in Grand Forks. Always appreciate you jumping on with us. And really have a great off-season, great summer. And we'll chat with you back in the fall, too. Oh, can't wait, fellas. Great to catch up.
Stick taps to Alex for joining us. Great conversation with him. Now, Pilsy, if people are wondering about a wider variety of impressions, how Jake Sanderson handled himself at North Dakota, where could I find it? Ross, I would direct those good people to our YouTube page, Locked On Centers on YouTube, because Ross and I, we made a day out of the Jake Sanders season signing, and uh, we did our own initial reaction. I think a lot of people like it when it's just like, hey, how do the boys feel about this right away? Boom, you got our initial reaction as soon as possible. Then, all right, don't just take it from us. You hear it from us every single day. Let's bring on an expert. So we brought Brad Schloschman onto the show, writer. Uh, he covers the North Dakota team. He's one of the best in the business, an absolute must-follow, especially because – Probably going to have still one Nodak Sens player yep. playing up in North Dakota at the Ralph. So definitely follow along with Brad and check out our 19-minute interview with him that we did yesterday on our YouTube page. Before we touch on the Mad Sogard situation once again and Belleville's weekend as a whole, let's give you a little clip from our interview with Brad Schlossman talking about the impact that Jake Sanderson has left on North Dakota hockey. What would you tell Ottawa Senators fans they're getting in Jake Sanderson? Well, uh, elite player, elite person. Um, he's a guy who I think when he was drafted, what everyone recognized was how well he can defend because of his skating, how he can gap up, how he can force turnovers when other teams are trying to enter the zone um, and go the other way. He makes really good little plays in the D zone. He can be in the corner on the wall and have two guys on him and make a little area pass to a teammate and it goes out. And I think if you're not watching really closely, those are the things that you overlook that he does well. Um, if you're just kind of sitting there watching, it's okay. They got his own exit. But when, if you're really watching close, you're like, man, there are two guys on him and he just calmly gave it to the one guy in space and they were out of the zone. So I think that's where his defense gets a lot of attention. Um, as Ottawa Senators fans thoroughly enjoyed trolling the people who thought he did not have any offense, they saw <laughs> he does have that as well. And again, it's through his skating. He, he skates so well that he can go around guys. He can create lanes. I think he's pretty deceptive when he has the puck at the blue line and there's a guy attacking him. Um, he doesn't really have a go-to move. I don't know what he's going to do. He could uh, shake his shoulders and go outside. He could go inside. He, you know, he just is kind of unpredictable, and I think that's what makes him tough to defend at the blue line. Um, as a freshman, the one thing he didn't do a whole lot of was finish plays. He could create a lot of chances. I don't think he's going to be a Kale McCarr and score however many goals Kale McCarr has right now. I don't know what it is. Um, but what he did show as a sophomore is that he can finish. Uh, he, he, he can beat a goalie with a wrist shot. Um, and, and I think that was something he developed this year. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately for North Dakota, he was injured so much of the year that, you know, uh, it would be fascinating to see his totals had he stayed healthy. You know, I'm, I'm guessing he would have won the Hobie Baker award uh, as the best player in the country, but he just didn't have the numbers to back it up. But yeah, I, I think you're seeing all of that. And then off the ice, uh, you know, can't say enough about him. He's a guy that instantly won his teammates over here um, as a freshman. He doesn't have, uh, uh, he's, he's not an arrogant guy. He's uh, a humble guy. And I, I think, you know, at North Dakota, a lot of times you get some top end prospects and, and this is true anywhere. Um, in, in their tick, their clock is ticking to the NHL, right? Like they're, they're short timers wherever they're at. And then they're going to be in the NHL. Some of those guys maybe have a half a foot out the door and Jake never did. He, he was all in with everything he did here. Uh, right to the last play, right to the last, <laughs> play. that, that was a great example of Jake, yeah. you know, um, you know, he dove head first into the crease ran into the post, did it, you know, everything he could to win. And that's all that mattered to him was winning at North Dakota and being with his teammates. And I think that's what endeared him to everyone there. And I think when he goes to Ottawa, I think that type of attitude will endear uh, everyone to him there. And, you know, I know the fans are expecting a lot. 
I, I, I would say, Hey, like he's still a young guy. Like he, he's probably going to have some growing pains. Like he, he probably isn't going to come in and win the Norris next year. Like it's going to take a little bit of time, but he is a special player and, and there is reason to be excited about it. So for more of that interview, go check out our YouTube page. You can find that all right there on Locked On Senators. So Pilsy, the Belleville Sens are back in a playoff spot if it started today. Are you confident that's going to continue as they won one, lost one on the weekend? I've got some confidence in this team. I mean, I, I caught the end of that shootout win over Lehigh Valley Phantoms and Jake Lucchini getting it done and Mad Sogard looking good as well. So I really think this team has everything they need to be successful. Now, it's going to be interesting to see how they do without Michael Delzato in the lineup. It seems like he's going to be an NHL mainstay now. And I'm not sure, how's Lassie coming along? I don't think we've had an update on Lassie anytime soon. So that's those are two big defensemen coming out of your lineup. So they're going to have to figure out a way to uh, make up for that. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it was four to six weeks initially, and it's been two and a half since the games in Belleville and, or sorry, in Manitoba. And it was after the Friday game he got hurt, so I wouldn't expect him back. Definitely not this upcoming weekend where they've got another three in three. So you need him back as soon as possible because just like Ottawa, Belleville had a whole lot of games rescheduled as well. So they play April first, second, third, sixth, eighth, and ninth. Yeah, that, that's a lot of hockey. Six games in nine nights. Wow. And that's the thing, Ross. Like we talked about Sogard being up in the NHL for two weeks as uh, your plan maps out. That's a lot of games for Philip Gustafson to handle all on his own. If McNiven truly is just a warm body placeholder guy like Gustafson hasn't played that stretch of games Oh, my, probably all season, honestly, right? Like, yeah. he's only been starting in Belleville for a short amount of time, and then he's just been backing up, and Forsberg's been playing almost every single night. So it's going to be very interesting to see how Philip Gustafson takes on this responsibility, and he's going to have to show them a big part of why they had so much faith and why they protected and why they gave him the one year next year. And this is a good chance to do that because, like you mentioned, two of uh, Belleville's most impactful defensemen not in the lineup for the foreseeable future. So very interesting times ahead for Gus. If people are curious about Jake Sanderson, yes, he can play in Belleville, but it's certainly not the plan unless they can make playoffs. I think you'd get to they see will him. make playoffs for us. Ooh, We're willing right. it into existence here. Let's go. All right. It's still a day-to-day -day thing where one day they could be in sixth yeah. place. The next they can be in second. So as the time of recording, they are currently in fifth place and there are... No direct divisional matchups today. Like Utica plays, but they are so far in first place. Yeah. It's not even close. Really, the games of, of value here, if you're a Belleville Sens fan, is Laval, Toronto, Syracuse, and Rochester. Yep. And we talked the other day, if they can keep Aaron Dell and the Rochester Americans out of the playoffs, that would just be the cherry on top of what was already a pretty good payback session, putting five past him, raising his career save percentage, but then sending him to the minors for the rest of eternity. But to keep him out of the playoffs would be an extra cherry on top, yep. no doubt. And, hey, they're getting contributions from the people you want to see them from, right? And uh, we got to give some stick taps as well. I think he's still taking a little time to get comfortable in his new role, but Zach Sinitian did get an assist yep. on Saturday. So he's officially on the score sheet. Parker Kelly, a goal as well. So good to see him take the demotion with pride. He's got points in three of four games. Um, sorry, so he didn't get a point in the first two games since he's been back, and then he has points in three of four since then. So and, I, I'm sure we'll see him sooner rather than later, but Pilsy, with Gus being papered down and then brought up, Delzato being brought up, and now Sogard, they only have one more call-up available for the rest of the season. Wow, yeah, true. I didn't think about that. Uh, so this Gus plan, like, this might be for the rest of the year. And I, uh, yeah, but then what? They're they're gonna bring McNiven up and then have Sogard and no. Well, if they bring McNiven up, then that counts as well. Yeah, but that that would be their last one, and then you have Sogard and Gus down there in Belleville because I think you want both of them there for the playoffs. Like, what well, if one what, gets hurt or once it's playoffs, Ottawa will be done. They they end the season on the same day. Yeah, true. So I guess then call-ups don't, don't matter at that no. point. Um, no. 
Yeah, it's going to be very interesting. Just quickly on Parker Kelly, I don't think it was so much a demotion. At, like, I don't know how to word this properly, but I think it was more like, Parker, we think you're doing so well that we think you're going to be more impactful down in Belleville rather than up here. And we need that skill and what you bring to the game down in Belleville, not really in Ottawa. Like I'm speaking as if I was Pierre Dorian, uh, first name <laughs> basis of Parker Kelly here. But that's what I think is more the picture, not like, okay, you weren't quite cut out for a fourth liner in the NHL. We're sending you down to work on some things. I think it's more, we think you did amazing up here. So now go do it down in Belleville. Yeah, tell his paycheck that it's not a demotion. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's very fair. But, hey, Parker Kelly's got that one way coming up, so he knows his cookies are coming. Absolutely. Hey, Brad Berry was on TSN 1200 with JR and Simmer today. He t- says that Sanderson is a one percenter. I think we know that, where he, he can go kind of one and done. He could have at least. He goes back for a second year and just absolutely lit it up. Go watch the, the breaking news video. We get into all that great stuff. 26 points in 23 games this year. For Jake Sanderson, but he also more or less confirmed what Alex told us, what Brad told us. The K train's going back to school. And, sources. And sources are saying that Jake Sanderson is going back to school. Or sorry, Tyler Clevin <laughs> is going back to school. And that's great. I wasn't ready to be done with the note accents either. Yeah, we, we got to go to the Ralph and we need a note accents player there. And to have it be the K train. Arguably a, a guy that plays a style of hockey we love the most on this show. We're pretty stoked about that. All right, so no changes to the lineup, but this was how the Senators lined up for practice today. I'll get your quick thoughts, Pilsy, and we'll move along from there. So Norris, Kachuk, Batherson, damn, that looks good, seeing it on paper back together again. Then Stutzla is between Formanton and Connor Brown. Tierney between Joseph and Colin White. And Dylan Gambrell between Tyler Ennis and Austin Watson. On defense, Branstrom Zub, Holden Zaitsev, Delzato, and Hamannick, and in goal, the one change, there's Sogard with Anton Forsberg. The extras are Gaudette and Mete. Pinto and Shabbat still out. Pinto skated this morning. So did Matt Murray for about 20 minutes before before the skate. Not sure if he took shots today. He skated for 20 minutes on his own uh, the other day as well. Did not take shots. So maybe that's a dark horse in all this where you don't have to burn another call up, Pilsy, is if Matt Murray could come back at any point in the season and then you can roll with Sogard and Gus sure. to finish out the year in the AHL. But are you surprised, disappointed? What, what's your vibe on keeping the same lineup going through thick and thin as it feels right now? I mean, I'm not surprised. Definitely uh, disappointed. Yeah, it, it, it sucks looking at a lineup where you're like, I don't know, this, this team is not quite going to get it done here. But then you look at the extras, Gaudet and Mete. I don't see a scenario where you put those extras in and take guys out and it changes things too much. And got it and Mete probably not going to be here next year. So I, I think this is the lineup I'd go with if I'm DJ Smith, but looking at it, like let's just take a quick peek at possibilities for next year. Switch out Tierney with Shane Pinto. So you got a line of Joseph Pinto white. That's a nice third line to me. And then Ennis out with Parker Kelly. And then you got Kelly, Gambrell, Watson as your, your fourth line there. This forward group is looking pretty good. Like we still are waiting or going to be waiting for Claude Giroux to come in and he's going to take a great spot in the top six here, obviously. But Fiala's also got 41 points in his last 30 games. Yeah. So once we plug those two guys in, that helps too. But I mean, <laughs> like if you're just looking at a conservative lens, like this lineup could be much better if it's healthy. And then go down to the decor, throw Shabbat and Sanderson in there and take out uh, Delzato and Zaitsev. There, there's a lot of pieces in place. So I, I think there's reasons for Sense fans to be optimistic about the future. The one change I would make to how the alignment is set up right now is I would move Colin White to third line center between Joseph and Ennis. Get a little more yes, skill up there. I like there. that. Because yeah. Joseph has produced i mean he had that great assist against winnipeg he's skating well and we've kind of beaten the dead horse already where or at least taken his legs out from under him talking about how tyranny just can't keep up with the play <laughs> like he used to so i think to get a little extra speed with joseph would be a huge added bonus right now but i'm not gonna nitpick i'm also curious because tsn 1200 had del Zotto and hamannick as the second pair holden and zaitsev as the third pair but again not reading too much into that we'll see what the ice time allocation is against Nashville. All right, we'll have more on tomorrow's Locked On Senators. Pilsy, any final thoughts before we go? 
Final thoughts are it, it's nice to have vibes back up. Like the vibes were down when I was in Montreal. It was, uh, there were Sens fans tweeting out like, I'm done with this team. Like there was utter chaos on Sens Twitter and just a lot of, uh, not a lot of good vibes, but things have certainly turned around with that. Martian was at, and then with Jake Sanderson signing, like, there are good things to come here, and let's let's all just enjoy them. Just be in the present moment. Don't be too sad about where the Sens are in the standings. Let's just enjoy this hockey while we got it. And I am very excited to see Mad Sogard get at least one start towards yes. the end of the year. So there are good things coming. We'll have a preview of the Nashville game tomorrow and a whole lot more. For the last time, we'll advise to please go check out our YouTube page. Subscribe there for all the great content. We want to give one last shout-out as well. Shout-out to Brian. We have to shout out Brian uh, Walkowiak. I hope I pronounced that right, hmm. Brian. He was the winner of the autographed Chris Neal card nice. uh, that we gave away on Friday. I, th- I think it was the Chris Neal card. We were giving away so many cards. I mean, <laughs> we just we can't keep them all on track anymore. But the latest card giveaway was for Brian. And stay tuned for game day giveaways on Twitter at Central. We yep. thank at Fighting Stutzla. For the giveaway ideas. All right, for Brandon Pillar, I'm Ross Levitan. Have a great day, everyone. We'll chat tomorrow. This has been the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day.